Chapter 17 Salacious Stories Admitted At noon Wednesday, Judge Roan announced that he would reverse his ruling, striking from the records that testimony of Conley regarding perversion and of having watched for Frank on previous occasions. Great excitement prevailed in the courtroom when the court made the new ruling. Solicitor Dorsey was applauded at his victory. It was the first of a series of ovations given the plucky young Solicitor General. On this occasion, however, it resulted in Attorney Arnold making a motion that the courtroom be cleared. Judge Roan refused to expel the audience, and the lawyer applied for a mistrial. His request immediately was overruled. Judge Roan held that all of Conley's testimony would remain in the records. This gave Solicitor Dorsey the opportunity that he wanted to bring in witnesses to corroborate this part of the Negro's story. C. B. Dalton, named by Conley as the man he had seen go up to Frank's office with two women, was one of the last witnesses called by the State. He is a carpenter. He admitted going to the factory with Daisy Hopkins, and says that on one occasion this woman introduced him to the young factory superintendent. On more than one occasion, he swore, he had seen women in Frank's private office. Frequently he saw soft drinks there, he said, and on one occasion the party had beer. On Thursday morning, after Dalton quitted the stand, and Dr. F. H. Harris had completed his testimony, which was interrupted when he had collapsed on the stand the previous week, the state rested. The defense immediately opened their case. They first directed their guns on the testimony of Dr. Harris. Dr. Leroy Childs was called to the stand. He asserted that many of Dr. Harris's deductions were guesswork. It would be a wild guess, he said, to fix the length of time any food had been in a human being's stomach before death. Dr. Childs and other physicians in the days that followed refuted other statements made on the stand by the Secretary of the State Board of Health. Harry Scott, Pinkerton detective, was recalled by the defense Thursday afternoon. Attorney Arnold sought to draw from him that Conley had been schooled in making his statements to the police. His intention was to leave before the jury's mind the possibility that Conley gathered the remarkable knowledge of details, and from that concocted his story. Scott admitted that on more than one occasion he and other detectives had remarked to Conley when endeavoring to get the truth from him, That won't do, Jim. It don't fit. On Friday, the eighth day of the trial, Frank's counsel called Daisy Hopkins to the stand. She flatly contradicted the testimony of Dalton and James Conley that she had ever visited the pencil factory for an immoral purpose. On this day also, the defense introduced a cardboard model of the pencil factory, which was used throughout the rest of the trial to illustrate the testimony of witnesses. The testimony of George Epps, who declared that he had ridden to the center of town on the same car with Mary Fagan on the day of the murder, was attacked by W. M. Matthews and W. T. Hollis, motorman and conductor of the car on which the girl rode to town. Both carmen declared that they had seen the little girl on the car, but that Epps was not there. They also maintained that she did not get off at Marietta and Forsyth Streets, but rode around the turn to Broad and Hunter Streets. Blueprints of every floor of the pencil factory were also introduced on this day. They were made by Albert Kaufman, a civil engineer. In every feature of the trial, the defense spared no expense to place before the jury its evidence in the best form. Experts of various kinds were called to refute incriminating testimony given by witnesses called by the state. The second week of the trial closed at noon Saturday with Herbert Schiff, Frank's young office assistant, on the witness stand. Through him the defense began to weave their famous time alibi, by which they tried to prove it would have been impossible for Frank to have committed the murder. Schiff declared on the stand 
that it was Frank's custom to make out the financial statement every Saturday afternoon, and that the work could not have been completed in less than two to three hours. He was shown the financial statement for the week of April 26, and identified the handwriting as that of Frank. He was subjected to one of the most severe cross-examinations of the case, but his testimony was unshaken. On Monday, August 11th, the defense again renewed their attack on Dr. Harris's testimony. Dr. Willis Westmoreland, former president of the State Board of Health, Dr. T. H. Hancock, Dr. J. C. Olmsted, and Dr. George Bachman declared that any physician who attempted to fix the time of death by the condition of food in the stomach of a corpse was only hazarding a guess. On this day also, the defense introduced a number of witnesses who swore that they would not believe C. B. Dalton on oath. They were nearly all from Walton County, where Dalton had previously resided, and all termed his character as bad. Later the defense recalled Dalton himself, and gained from him admissions that he had been arrested on several occasions in his past life on larceny charges. Miss Hattie Hall, stenographer and bookkeeper for Montag Brothers, was called to add a link to the time alibi. She told of meeting Frank at Montag Brothers on the morning of the day of the murder, and his requesting her to come to the factory and do stenographic work for him. She asserted that he also asked her to come back that afternoon. Miss Hall testified that she had remained at the factory until two or three minutes after twelve. She fixed the time of her departure by the blowing of the twelve o'clock whistle. Joel Hunter, an expert accountant and another proficient mathematician, declared that Frank could not have completed the financial report in much less than three hours, and there was other minor work on office account books which would have taken him anywhere from thirty minutes to two hours longer, he said. This meant that Frank, on the afternoon of April 26, after Mary Fagan had been killed, carried on the routine office work of the factory. On Wednesday, the fifteenth day of the trial, Frank's character was put in issue. The move was not unexpected. In taking this step, counsel for the accused superintendent defied the state to produce witnesses who would put a blot on his character. Two former classmates at Cornell, now of New York, who came to Atlanta solely to testify, said that his character was excellent. They were followed during the next few days with other friends of Frank at school and one or two college professors who made the long trip south to be with their former fellow in his hour of need. Scores of the most widely known men in the city took the stand and said that they had never known a smirch on the character of the factory head. Efforts of the defense to introduce experiments of four men who reenacted the carrying of the body to the basement, as told on the stand by Conley, met with vigorous opposition on the part of Solicitor Dorsey and Attorney Hooper. Frank's attorneys sought to show that it would have taken more than twice the time to hide the body that the Negro said it would. After an argument of an hour, Judge Roan allowed the evidence. Dr. William Owens then gave an account of how he and three other men had carried a sack weighing a 110 pounds, the same as Mary Fagan's body, into the basement and gone through the other alleged actions of Conley and Frank on the day of the murder. It took them more than thirty minutes, he said. Conley gave fifteen minutes as the estimate of the time. On cross-examination, Attorney Hooper went thoroughly into every detail of the experiment in an effort to discount its value. He succeeded many times during the afternoon in bringing the jury and audience to mirth. Attorney Hooper also attempted to prove that Dr. Owens was unduly interested in the case. He produced a letter written to the grand jury before the trial, asking the indictment of Conley as an accessory. Dr. Owens said that he had written the communication at the compulsion of his conscience. When John Ashley Jones took the stand 
to tell of Frank's character, the state opened its first attack upon the superintendent's moral reputation. When the witness was turned over for cross-examination, Dorsey was on his feet in a minute, hurling questions one after the other. You never heard it said that he took girls in his lap at the factory, did you? No. Did you ever talk to L.T. Corsi or Miss Myrtle Cater? You never heard them say that Frank would walk into the women's dressing rooms without offering any explanation for this intrusion? No. Did you ever hear of him trying to put his arm around Miss Myrtle Cater and attempting to shut the door just before the factory closed one afternoon? At this point, Mrs. Ray Frank, mother of the defendant, turned in her seat and faced the solicitor. No, no, you either, she cried, you dog. It was a tense moment. The court was thrown into an uproar. Attorney Arnold, in a sympathetic voice, said, Mrs. Frank, if you stay in the courtroom, I'm afraid you'll have to hear these vile, slanderous lies, and I would suggest that if you have reached the limit of your patience, you might retire for a little while. Mrs. Frank arose and was escorted through the crowded courtroom to the door by attorney Herbert Haas and some other men of the Frank party. Mrs. Lucille Frank showed considerable emotion for the first time since her husband's trial began, and the face of the accused man flushed when the solicitor hurled his sensational question at the witness. Dorsey then continued his questioning. Do you know Tom Blackstock? No. You didn't hear how Frank stood and looked at poor little Gordy Jackson? You didn't hear how it was the talk of the factory? No. You didn't hear what he tried to do to Lula MacDonald and Rachel Prater? No. You didn't hear what he said to Mrs. Pearl Dodson when he stood talking to her and her daughter with money in his hand? And you didn't hear how she hit him with a monkey wrench? No. You didn't talk to Mrs. C. D. Dunnigan? You didn't talk to Mrs. C. D. Dunnigan and Miss Marianne Dunnigan about him? No. You didn't hear how he was accustomed to slap girls? And how he had nude pictures in his office? You did not talk to Mrs. Wingard of 45 Mill Street about him, did you? No. The solicitor finished his examination suddenly at this point, and sat down, silence falling over the court. Mrs. Ray Frank remained away from the courtroom during the entire afternoon. She appeared in an automobile at adjournment time, however, and gave her son his usual good-night kiss. Next day she resumed her seat by his side, and never again during the trial did she interrupt the court with an interjection. The defense fought bitterly this attempt of Solicitor Dorsey to get the implications of these questions before the jury. Attorney Arnold repeatedly termed the tactics unfair, unjust, and unethical. Judge Roan allowed them to remain in the record, however. Thursday morning, August 14th, Solicitor Dorsey upon the opening of court, asked that Mrs. Leo and Mrs. Ray Frank be excluded from the courtroom. He feared another outbreak like the one of Wednesday afternoon. I am doing only my duty, he said in addressing the court, and it is unfair to allow someone in the room who will heap abuse upon me. Judge Roan refused to comply with the solicitor's request when the women threw attorney Arnold agreed to make no more interruptions.